Hi, it's Joni Michaels, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Joe Clark, host of Consider This Program. Joe's a certified financial planner and former professor at Purdue University. He's the managing partner for the Financial Enhancement Group. Joe's passion is teaching people about their money so they don't make inefficient financial decisions that lead to frustration and devastation. The Financial Enhancement Group serves more than 900 families in 31 states and manages more than $400 million. The Financial Enhancement Group takes care of people who don't want to worry about their money so they don't make inefficient financial decisions. Joe addresses your questions about money and five critical elements of finance, retirement planning, or what we like to call your life after work, tax planning, investment planning, life happens, the good, the bad, and the ugly of life, and legacy planning. The Financial Enhancement Group can be reached at 800-928-4001 or visit yourlifeafterwork.com. The Financial Enhancement Group is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Securities offered through World Equity Group, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Well, good morning and welcome to Consider This. I'm your host, Joe Clark. And I'm Angie Kinzer. Happy to have you along. I hope you're having an, the best weekend week that you can possibly have. I have got great news for you. This is going to be an exciting show. If nothing else in the world seems right right now, uh, there are still good people writing good things. I had on uh, a friend, on, which will be on a podcast as well, so don't forget to download our podcast. If you listen to the radio show, I'm happy to have you there. You can go to iTunes or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. The name of the program, remember, is Consider This Program. You do have to put in the word program, uh, and you will find a 40-minute version of what you're going to get about 15 minutes of today on the show. Um, but it is a... Uh, conversation that I had with Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Uh, for those of you who are longtime listeners, you know that he wrote a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. Uh, I gave <laughs> Angie a copy. Um, I'm not sure Angie read it, but I did give her Do a copy. Do you want me to say I don't, you know, where it was used? Well, uh, there, uh, Remember it had my <laughs> computer stand, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't buy books for a lot of people anymore if they don't, if they don't say they want to read them. But it's, uh, I read um, probably 25 to 35 books a year, depending on the year. And I would put Willpower Doesn't Work very much in the top 10 books that have, have directly impacted my life and how I look at it. A lot of books that you talk about I've obviously read. I mean, you you, you know, back in the old days when Checklist Manifesto was Absolutely. Your thing. Oh, checklist, <laughs> checklist Manifesto would still be one of the top 10. Um, it absolutely would. But his new book's coming out in a couple of weeks. Personality Isn't Permanent, um, challenges the, the validity uh, and actually even the, the, whether it's even good for you to take some of the personality tests that are coming around, uh, the Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram, you know, those kind of things. And so it's, it's an interesting conversation. It's going to be an interesting book. I'm about a third of the way through it. Look forward to it. We're also going to talk about buybacks today and what that means, how it impacts your portfolio, uh, whether it is a good thing for you or for the stock market or, or not. Uh, and hopefully, we're going to get to a little bit of conversation over education. That is a big deal going on right now because of the, the struggles and challenges that universities are in. So with that, Angie, do you have any uh, anything you want to add? Well, I think we're going to talk a little bit about maybe international investing. Oh, we might get there. <laughs> okay. It's, it's going <laughs> to depend on what's going on. So anyhow, don't forget to call Angie, 800-928-4001. Get signed up for your Next Steps meeting. We are now back live. Though every now and then we still have somebody that needs to do it via Zoom, and that's fine too. But give her a call, 800-928-4001. Uh, we will spend 90 minutes with you, tell you things you need to consider today, things you're going to want to consider in the future, and if we choose to partner together, what FEG will do for you. 800-928-4001. We'll take a break and be right back. Hi, Joni Michaels here. Joe's been hosting financial radio programs for over 20 years, and during his seven years at Purdue, Joe developed the five critical elements. You see, there are five areas we all go through that can impact and even derail our retirement plans. YourLifeAfterWork.com has been focused on you on your retirement for over 20 years. You may have had a 401k as well as IRAs. Those are all defined contribution plans. Consider this program is about your defined contribution plans becoming defined distributions. You see, we all exit. You'll either take money out of those retirement plans when you decide or when the IRS decides, or your heirs will have to deal with the situation, but we all exit. I encourage you to call 800-928-4001 to meet with one of the talented financial advisors at the Financial Enhancement Group. I've listened to this show for years, and what Joe says just makes sense. Don't you think it's time for you to call 800-928-4001, yourlifeafterwork.com. Now let's get back to the show. 
Have you ever wondered what a stock buyback is? They're all over the news right now, and some people vilify them, some people cherish them. It's an interesting conversation. We're going to break down for you what a stock buyback is today. You're listening to Consider This Program. I'm your host, Joe Clark. I am Angie Kinzer. We are happy to have you along. So, Angie, go ahead and fire off your questions. I'm ready to roll. Well, let's start with the obvious of defining a stock buyback. I mean, what is it? Ah, pretty simple. So when a company has profit, um, has money over it, left over at the end of the day, it can choose to do a few things with it. It can choose to take that money and reinvest in the business, um, build plants, hire people, buy computers, things you see us do. It can take that money and it can have, if it's a corporation, it can have retained earnings. It can say, we don't need the money right now, but we may need to use it in the future so that we have a rainy day fund. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the municipalities that had, you know, 19 billion versus Illinois with 3 million, yes. right? Um, you know, so you can save it for a rainy day when you, when you might need it and have to dip into it. You can take the money and the board of directors can authorize a dividend. So a dividend is taxed at the corporate level. And then it's turned around and taxed on your tax return, right? Now, if you're in a 401k, it's not taxed on your tax return until you spend the money, right? Right? Or until you have to take it out. But if you've got a regular retail account, you have to do that. So what some companies choose to do is to authorize buybacks. So they will actually go out into the public market and they see a share price that's down and they will go in and buy it. Like repurchase um, their they own? They will repurchase their own stock. It becomes treasury stock. And so since no dividend is attached to a treasury stock, you don't pay dividends to your own stock that you already own in the company, right? right? Um, that by definition, you have fewer shares in the marketplace. And as a result, the share price should go up. Um, so the, the question is, you know, are, are businesses, when they're buying stock, you know, being, making right decisions uh, for, the, for the company and for everything else? Well... With a sudden market correction, kind of like what we just experienced, does that cause liquidity issues for businesses? Sure, because, the, I mean, nobody saw a pandemic coming, right? But the, right. the job is part of my job, and, and uh, I get challenged with that when we have the FEG forward. We don't have retreats at FEG. We have forwards. We're always looking ahead, right? Part of my job as the managing partner is to make sure that we are prepared for illiquidity issues, you know, if there would be a major market correction or if something happened. And... You know, when, when you have a market fall 30%, right, or you have companies, uh, virtually a, an economy that comes to a standstill, you have liquidity issues. And companies rarely go bankrupt over balance sheet issues. They go bankrupt over not being able to pay short-term bills. So was there added pressure with the shutdowns during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, sure, mean, there, sure there was. I mean, we, we, you know, all 29 of us functioned remotely. Um, nobody lost their jobs. That was very good. But nobody can argue that we were at 100% capacity working from home. Right? We had screaming children in some houses. We had internet issues <laughs> in some places. better for some we, than others. We went, yes, we went to 29 different locations. You know, we went from four one day to 29. Well, I guess we have seven locations. But, you know, most, the majority of the 29 of us are in four places. And we went from four to 29 yes. in a day. And uh, that, was a, that was a little bit of a challenge. Yes. Um, well, I think about some of the fraud, you know, fraudulent stories we've heard about, obviously, you know, Shrinker or who's the guy you had? Madoff. His, Madoff. You had, used to have a, one of his statements. I did. I think it was handwritten. But <laughs> oh, does something like this open up? Well, that's, that's the big argument right now. There was an article in the New York Times uh, that said when you, when you look at companies, I believe it was 135 this is the early May, that 135 big companies spent, in another word to do that is invested, um, but the bias of the author comes out very clearly, spent <laughs> 40, more than $40 billion on buybacks in the month of March alone. All right, so if I'm a CEO, and in March we didn't know as much about COVID as we do in May, right? right. And we don't know, as, we, we know more in June than we knew in May, and we're probably going to know more in July and August and September than we do right now, Right. You know, so if I'm a if I'm a CEO and I'm looking at my share price going down 30 percent or 40 percent or 50 percent, and I have what we call visibility, the ability to look forward, I, I'm kind of doing an injustice to my 
company if I don't go in and buy back that stock. And we, you, we can talk about a market correction as of the 1st of June, you know, the market is pretty much recorrected, right? It's, I mean, we went down hard and we came back up hard. Um, if you woke up at June 1st and you'd been in a coma since January 1st, you would think this is a normal year, right? I mean, you would have no idea that anything happened in the marketplace. But because of all of the money that is inside of the, the PPP, right, the, the, the loans that were granted and a lot of the protection that came out, there are advocates that are saying part of the contingency of that is you can't buy back shares for a certain number of years or until your funding is paid back or any of those kind of things. And, and they're being made to look like a bad investment or a bad, a bad tool, like you're being evil, right? So let, let's just look at this. Let's say, let's say I'm a CEO of a company and I make coffee cups. That's what we always like to talk yes. about on the show. My very expensive coffee cup. Um, it's not really expensive and it's not really Starbucks, but it is a Starbucks coffee cup. So we make coffee cups and I know that I spend a hundred thousand dollars a month and I know on, on overhead and on maintenance and everything else. And we make a million dollars a month. Okay. Right. And so I've got a couple years worth of cash in the bank, right. To be able to, to fund my enterprise. Right. So I'm, I'm being smart. I've taken care of normal operating stuff that is there. Um, and I've got extra profit. Now, can I content, can I figure out how to make twice as many coffee cups for twice as many, much profit? If I can, then I would probably get labeled as a growth company. And that's just a term we use in the investment world. And I would reinvest in my business. Now, how do I reinvest? Well, I go buy buildings. I go buy hire people. I go do things. So the question, the challenge that I have really, I mean, when you, when you think about this, when a stock price goes down 30%, if my profit margin is 20%, if I only, if I make more coffee cups and I expect to only make 20% on that, and right now my stock price is down 30% and it shouldn't be, then the investment in buying back the stock is better than me building a new right. company, right? I mean, there's just no way around it. Additionally, I'm responsible to my shareholders, right? So I'm responsible to my team, that's you. I'm responsible to my shareholders, right? And obviously the people that we serve. If I, if, I, if, if I issue a dividend, that's taking money out of the company. It's going into my back pocket. I'm paying taxes on it. The company's paying taxes on it. If I take that money, however, and buy back stock, I go and I look at Adam and, and Taylor and Aaron, you know, other partners, Donnie, other people who own shares in FEG and, or my coffee cup making company, right? And I say, I want to buy back some of those shares if they're willing to sell them, then I can use that money to buy back those shares, right? Yeah. And there's no tax consequence inside the company. They have a tax consequence because they sold at a profitability, but it probably drove the share price higher, right? So that's really, that's really what's going on. And people are saying, hey, it was irresponsible of these 135 companies to buy $40 billion worth of stock and then turn around and scream that they need funding. And you, know, you can look at it both ways. I will just tell you as a leader, there is a certain level of risk that you know you have to be prepared for, a certain amount of volatility that exists. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to be prepared for a pandemic, you know, that can shut an entire United States economy down, you know, for a, for a few month period of time. Uh, it was, it's an entirely different world. But believe me, there will be political conversations between now and election time over buybacks, how they look, whether they're right for people or not. You're listening to Consider This Program. I'm Joe Clark, along with Angie Kinzer. Give Angie a call, 800-928-4001, or go to yourlifeafterwork.com. Schedule a meeting. We look forward to talking to you soon. Hi, Joni Michaels here. We know you care about your money, but are you tired of worrying about it? The Financial Enhancement Group takes care of people just like you who don't want to worry about their money. As fiduciaries, the team at the Financial Enhancement Group will care for your nest egg just like they would care for their own. If they were in your situation, there are many decisions you'll need to make as you face retirement, and the team at the Financial Enhancement Group is here to help you. Call 800-928-4001 or go to yourlifeafterwork.com to set up a time to meet. The confusion and complexity of retirement is almost as daunting as is the excitement of retirement. Don't let your fear and frustration of taxes and investing derail your retirement. Call the Financial Enhancement Group at 800-928-4001. They'll give you a complimentary second opinion on your strategy for retirement. Begin your adventure in your life after work. Call 800-928-4001 or yourlifeafterwork.com. Now back to Consider This Program with Joe Clark. 
Inflation is a pesky little burger. There's just no way around it. There are words we use for inflation. CPI, Consumer Price Index, Fixed st- uh, Social. There's all sorts of things that we can talk about. In the next few minutes, we're going to try to break down for you inflation, the worries that we have today, the concerns, and the impact on the world. You're listening to Consider This Program. I'm your host, Joe Clark. I'm Angie Kinzer. Happy to have you all along. So what is inflation, Angie? If I was going to ask you that question, what would you say it was? Um, I think that's where the cost of living kind of um, exceeds what the interest is you're making on something. And well, so, no, that's a problem with inflation, right? Okay. Do, you, do you want, you're a homeowner, do you want the value of your house to go up? Yes. That's inflation. So appreciation. Do you want me to pay you more next year? Yes. That's inflation. Okay. So so the, so the as that continues to climb and the funds stay the same, it's not worth as much. It's not. It, it, if, and, and it's the problem. It's why if you stick all of your money in a bank account, you have no risk of volatility. You do. You just don't know it. But you have no risk of volatility, but you have a definite loss of inflation why when we look at the fiduciary focus, easy for me to say, um, (laughs) there are four things we pay attention to. You have to pay attention to all the time. Risk and volatility, fees and expenses, taxes today and tomorrow, and real return. Real is what we get when we talk about inflation. So this is a big, big topic right now because of the massive amount of money that the Federal Reserve uh, and the United States Treasury has put into the system to fight the, the, the COVID economy, if you will. You know, what happened in 2020 to write the PPP loans, all of those things, over $3 trillion. I mean, we really made the amount of money that we put into the QE programs back in 08 and 09 look like child's play. The interesting part is well, it wasn't just us. It, uh, and, and if we get to international investing today, we'll talk about that too. It, Japan did it. The Euro region's doing it. I mean, this is a this is a very very focused thing. So you have to pay attention to your portfolio inside of inflation. Now we get a lot of questions about Social Security living and cost adjustments. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest um, things that I get. We have a specialist on our on our team. Uh, Dean Huddleston is our Social Security guy. Uh, we send him to school and have him get educated. We truly function as a planning team here. Um, so I serve as the managing partner, uh, the director of financial planning then assigns tasks out to, uh, the, the other five planners that we have. Uh, and then they get, they become very, very experienced, uh, and knowledgeable in particular areas like, um, Darren, um, Hardesty is our able, you know, our special needs guy, if you will, uh, that we kind of go to, uh, I will probably always be the estate planner until I continue to teach other people just because it's been my passion. But when you get to the cost of living adjustments, so you'll see the word COLA. That's what a cost of living adjustment is. It is based on an index. That index is the consumer price index that comes from urban communities uh, around the United States. And it's broken. It, it's, it's put together both of the price appreciation of goods. Those mm-hmm. are hard things that you buy and services. Okay. That's your hair. Right. That's uh, nail, nails, you know, the those the somebody mowing your yard, somebody painting your house. So there's goods and services. Part of the challenge that happens inside of inflation is the older we get, the more go- more services we need and the less goods we buy. And so having a number that is really made up of both of those is maybe representative of the entire economy, but it's not necessarily representative of you. Right. So when people come in and they've been given this number of a 3% inflation expectation. Uh, when you're 20, I'll buy that you're going to have a 3% inflation expectation over your life, right? Um, when you're 65, that's not fair. It's not right. Your, your, your services are going to inflate more than 3% a year just because we have less and less people doing work in the areas that you need the work done. I mean, how much will you pay for a plumber to come when things don't work. And there, and there's a, just a limited number of people who are wanting to do that. So inflation is a great concern for me and something that very, very much needs to be inside of your financial plan. Now, when we look at Social Security, they didn't even used to half cost of living allowances. There wasn't any. They started that in the mid 70s, right at the peak, of, near the peak of inflation. The peak of inflation was 1980. And the whole program is put at jeopardy because we've done this cost of living increase that's there. 
08 and 09 were the first two years that I remember there not being any cost of living allowance. 2018, I believe there was no cost of living allowance. And right now, based on the data that we got in the first quarter, um, part, in big part because oil fell so quickly and swiftly, um, there is a large chance that people will not get a cost of living allowance in 2021. Um, we don't know that yet. You have up until October to, to hope for inflation, I guess, if that's what you're looking for. Um, but that's really where we are. And inflation is an issue. So the last one that we had, was that in 2019? We had one, in th we had one for this year. Oh. We had one in 220. Remember, because it, they, they tell you in October or November, um, they tell us near the end of the year what it's going to be for the next year. Yes. Seems like I always read like that in October. 1.6%. Right. And not, I mean, not huge, but it's um, the, uh, one of the reports that I was reading um, earlier uh, when I was looking at this, I think it was the, the $100, 20 years ago, $100 in Social Security is worth about $70 of purchasing power today. And I don't quote me on the 20 years, but I think that's what I remember reading. But it was over the last 20 to 25 years. And, and it's, the bottom line is inflation has snuck up on people. How does it impact accounts that are already low interest? Um, you know, like you, you want to be safe, so you go put it all in CDs. Well, because you use that word safe, that means you want less volatility, right? right? So, so the reason you have the fiduciary focus, and, you know, if you – if you want to do this on your on your own, that's your business. If you're looking for a fiduciary, that's our business, right? And you can give us a call at 800-928-4001. But if you're your fiduciary, if you're the one making the financial decisions or you're working with somebody who sells you products, you're still the fiduciary. Your role is the same role that I have, the same responsibility that I have for you, you have for you. And that means you've got to have a disciplined approach that says, I have to worry about I have to worry about volatility today and I have to worry about real return over the long term and if I don't take care of both I'm going to have a bad future right I'm either going to have plenty of sleepful nights right now where I'm not worrying at all about what the market is doing and I'm going to be a dead broke person you know asking if you know asking if you want fries with that um, you know in a, in another 10 years nobody wants that for their retirement right that's not the plan and believe me, purchasing power is expensive. I mean, it's missing it. It's expensive. What about pensions? Are they affected by... They, so most pensions, most private pensions, do not have a COLAs, right? So you retire, and I agree to pay you $1,000 a month, and you're going to get $1,000 a month. If you live to be 164, you're still getting $1,000 a month. So by definition, the, there is inflationary concerns, but they're concerns to you. Right. right. It's one of the things we talk about people when they buy annuities where they're going, oh, my, my, oh, my, my, I'm worried about risk and volatility. I can buy this annuity and get this income that's protected. Um, one, that's not always true. But two, you got to factor in inflation. If two people make it to age 60, actuaries say there's an above 90 percent probability one of you will make it to 90. Right. You just can't afford to take that risk. Folks, you're listening to consider this program. I am your host, Joe Clark along with Angie Kinzer, and you ought to really give her a call. 800-928-4001. Get signed up for your Next Steps meeting. Right? If you come in, we, we're doing these live and in person now. You can still do them Zoom, but we do them live in person. But in 90 minutes, we'll tell you things you need to consider today, things you're going to want to consider in the future, and if we choose to pardon together, what FEG will do for you. 800-928-4001 or go to yourlifeafterwork.com. Hi, Joni Michaels here. Joe's been hosting financial radio programs for over 20 years, and during his seven years at Purdue, Joe developed the five critical elements. You see, there are five areas we all go through that can impact and even derail our retirement plans. YourLifeAfterWork.com has been focused on you on your retirement for over 20 years. You may have had a 401k as well as IRAs. Those are all defined contribution plans. Consider this program is about your defined contribution plans becoming defined distributions. 
You see, we all exit. You'll either take money out of those retirement plans when you decide or when the IRS decides, or your heirs will have to deal with the situation, but we all exit. I encourage you to call 800-928-4001 to meet with one of the talented financial advisors at the Financial Enhancement Group. I've listened to this show for years, and what Joe says just makes sense. Don't you think it's time for you to call 800-928-4001, yourlifeafterwork.com. Now let's get back to the show. Before before the beginning of this year, according to independent research, more than 30% of the private and public universities in the United States are already functioning at a deficit. That was before this all happened. We need to talk about education. I'm not going to get into reform today, though I definitely have opinions. Um, but we do need to talk about college funding and what you need to consider before you go to college or before you send one of your kids off to going to school. Both my niece and Angie's daughter are in that same situation right now. You're listening to Consider This Program. I am your host, Joe Clark. I'm Angie Kinzer. We're happy to have you along. So when you see 30% of something is not working, right, um, in, the, uh, in the private sector, that means we, uh, we fold shop, right? We, we quit. I mean, if, if 30% of the businesses weren't profitable, they would just get shut down. And yet we have 30% of the universities and institutions, private and public, that are functioning at a deficit right now um, before the virus hit. Yeah, what that, kind of impact is that going to have? That it's, well, we know it's huge, and we'll walk through some of the stuff that, that, we, that we think people should talk about. Um, there's a university, we have an office in Rensselaer um, in the Huth Thompson building up there, and uh, there was a university up there named St. Joe, they asked me to come play football. I almost went instead of uh, instead of going down to Bloomington. I almost went, and um, so you know, then I spent my seven years teaching at Purdue uh, as an adjunct. So I, I guess between all of them, I'm a boilermaker more than anything. But sadly enough, I think it was two years ago, St. Joe just announced they didn't have any more money and shut the doors. Oh. And originally, the people were going to be able to transfer to Purdue to get all their credits in. I've been told by more than one person that didn't work. But imagine going someplace and then not getting, not being able to get an education, right? I mean, it's it's huge. So you've got to pay attention to um, what is going on in the school system and what schools you're going to. So, Angie, I think you've got some questions that you've put together. So go ahead and. Well, I mean, going back to what I the comment that I just made, it said could could universities be on real jeopardy if the health crisis isn't solved by fall? Um, because, you know, what happened is they all went to this kind of online learning. But I wonder if some people will postpone education now just thinking, well, it's a, there's a difference between signing up for online classes and showing up on campus that fall. There is a difference in the excitement, the thrillability factor, right? Especially when people make a large argument that you don't send kids to school to get an education. You send them there to get socialized. Um, I've never bought into that. I thought that was a pretty expensive party for four years. It's almost always four and a half, by the way, um, you know, or longer, or they don't make Five, it through, right? Me. Yeah, you know, it's uh, just one of those things to consider. I, th there's, there's so many different ways to look at, at, at education and what's going to happen. So um, our state universities, Purdue, has already announced, you know, we're, we're, open, we're open for business. My niece is going, you know, Purdue's not going anywhere, and, and the, the president of the university is just doing a great job keeping tuition in check. Uh, and running it, r running it close. Now, I haven't heard this, and so you know, you may know more about this than I do. But one of the national trends that's going on, especially in in state ran, -ran colleges, is they're only allowing one person in a dorm room. Hmm. Right. So what happened in when this first broke out? People who are early thought thinkers uh, in terms of you know what happens immediately started selling short. Um, or so selling out of uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts that ran college housing, right? They, they got out of them because, you know, the kids aren't going to be at school. They're not going to pay rent. You know, some of the universities have reimbursed people and done all of that. Well, now the universities have announced that they're coming back into gear. And guess what? They're only going to let one person be in a room, right, for safety factors. Well, social distancing, think about what we've got going on here. Right? Usually you think of groups of 10 or more, and but two. No, well, no, no, not in a dorm. They're, at IU it was two, 
At Purdue, it was two in most places. Well, yes, but right. I mean, I wouldn't think it'd be dangerous having a roommate. I, I'm i not the one coming up with these rules. Uh, no. It wasn't any of my part, but that means you now suddenly have a housing shortage yes. in some of these places, right? So now all of a sudden, you're going to see this building go back up. So you just think about a V when you think about a V-shaped recovery, right? The how, the the initial ha school housing uh, projects that were private died. Now they're rebounding very, very quickly. And you saw the home builders, I believe it was last week, uh, have one of their best months in uh, in history. Um, so very, very interesting stuff and, and some of the things that are going on. What can we do um, to stop learning like slide backs if facilities close? I know that not so much at a university level, and that's what we're talking about. But I did read some instances where high schools, um, some high school in Philadelphia, took them two months to get their kids onto some kind of online online program so they were closed down and it's like you can't go back and just get that education you're no just... you can't make it for that last time and and there's going to be you're going to hear more and more about that you know we take you know a half an hour away from indianapolis is where we live we've got an office in indy an office in coming in brownsburg and one here in anderson and one in lafayette we we have plenty of wi-fi everywhere right there are people out in the boondocks that had no Wi-Fi to do public education, right? That you're gonna you're gonna begin to hear about. They had to go to the libraries, yeah. And uh, and the libraries were closed, right? In in New York and other places where they were mandatorily shut down, you know, it just didn't it didn't fly and it didn't work. You're gonna hear a lot of those tragic stories. Um, they let people out of very you know one of one of our um, one of our families is a, was a pharmacist and she was in her last year of pharmacy at Purdue. And they said, congratulations, you're a pharmacist. Yeah. Right? Um, yes. You know, I, 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 heard they, I heard they did that at a couple of med schools. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of that that happened. And we're just trying to, we, we all know as employers, you learn on the job. I mean, I've, I've yet to hire anybody who showed up who could do what we have them do. Um, you know, it's, I, I just haven't. And, you know, we all know that. And I, I hate to say it, that happens probably in, in medicine as well, but it probably does. Right. I mean, there's just things you've got to learn, protocols and everything else that you learn while you're there. I know my daughter at her school, she did not like the online because she goes to a school where it's very hands on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So to to leave and do everything online at the end of the year, she just was really kind of lost. I, I get it. Um, but I also think I think one of the major changes you're going to see in education, and that's that's where I would if if my kids were getting ready to go to school again, and I still have one in nursing school. Um, nursing school, I think, needs to be hands-on, and of course, they're online doing doing clinicals online. Um, but hopefully, that's fixed by the by the time we get to the fall. the The challenge that I think you're going to have in the education world is if it's not about the institution, if it's not about being on campus, then it really, really, really is about the education, right? And so, you know, if when I left Purdue, I, I jokingly said I was going to film a semester worth of classes and sell it to universities for 25 grand. And instead of them hiring a professor, they could just put me up on a wall to teach the, to teach the kids. Uh, I very much think this is going to happen. They call it, today we call it visiting professors. Um, I, I think there's gonna be, I, I think professors will have agents that will find people in different schools and say, hey, you can teach at MIT and you can teach at Stanford and you can teach at Harvard, all three at the same time and it will be done online. Uh, or, you know, you, Ava's in a class and she's got a boring professor and she needs to learn how to do speech and debate and you go, Joe, you know, can we, will you help? <laughs> the problem with her is her major's molecular biology. Yeah, I got um, it, I got biology, it. And there's a lot of labs that so need to be done. The one, the one thing I would tell you, if you did get a check back, because I haven't, haven't heard a lot of people talk about this. If you happen to get a check back and used a 529 plan, remember you've got 60 days to put it in. Uh, to get it back in the 529 plan, no tax penalty at all if you do that. Uh, and it doesn't stop you from making a contribution this year either. Um, so if you get a check back, make sure you do that. College and education are going to change. Um, how we function in the future as a society is going to change. I'm going to challenge you in the next, se in the next segment uh, how, how things to think about that and, uh, and how to process it. So Angie and I'll take a break. Give her a call, 800-928-4001, or go to yourlifeafterwork.com. 
Hi, Joni Michaels here. We know you care about your money, but are you tired of worrying about it? The Financial Enhancement Group takes care of people just like you who don't want to worry about their money. As fiduciaries, the team at the Financial Enhancement Group will care for your nest egg just like they would care for their own. If they were in your situation, there are many decisions you'll need to make as you face retirement, and the team at the Financial Enhancement Group is here to help you. Call 800-928-4001 or go to yourlifeafterwork.com to set up a time to meet. The confusion and complexity of retirement is almost as daunting as is the excitement of retirement. Don't let your fear and frustration of taxes and investing derail your retirement. Call the Financial Enhancement Group at 800-928-4001. They'll give you a complimentary second opinion on your strategy for retirement. Begin your adventure in your life after work. Call 800-928-4001 or yourlifeafterwork.com. Now back to Consider This Program with Joe Clark. Speaking of good, I have got one of my good friends that is going to be on the show with us today, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ben just because his story is so fascinating. Um, And I met Ben a couple years ago, November of 2018. Um, and, uh, and honestly, uh, the meeting him really, really changed my life, which we'll get into in a second. But, um, when, when you look at Ben Hardy and we walk through his, some of his journey and he'll take you through part of that, when he was able to transform himself by doing exactly what he talked about in his first book, which is the, or the first book that I know of that he wrote, the willpower, um, willpower won't work. And that book really changed my life. I bought 50 copies, handed it out to the church. Uh, handed it out to everybody in my company and all of my friends. It is a great read, and as far as I'm concerned, a must-read that you have to have. So with all of that, Dr. Ben Hardy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, man. And I guess both of you. I've never met a partner in crime, but grateful to be with both of you. She is a partner in crime, that is for sure. And she got a hold of... uh, So so Ben's first book, which I really want to talk about too, but he's got another book coming out that is... Um, that personality is not permanent, which will be out in a couple of weeks, if that's correct. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I've, uh, I, I'm have i lucky enough to have a third a, a copy of it um, to be able to preview. So I'm about a third of the way through the book, and I got it on Friday night at about 9 o'clock, and we're taping this on a Monday, Monday, Monday afternoon. So that's how quickly I read it. Angie and I are big into, for those of you who've listened to the show a long time, talking about personality test and and things like that so so when she saw the title of the book and then read some of your questions she is ready to roll and has questions for you oh my goodness but, this is great but let's let's <laughs> let's get to uh let's get to what what was the driver behind willpower doesn't work what's the thesis the thesis of that book is that here in Western culture, we are we're very individualistic, and so we tend to focus on the individual, and we ignore the context or the environment that shapes the individual. And from a psychological standpoint, that's a big error in thinking. Uh, one of the core mistakes that we make in our judgments is what's called the fundamental attribution error, which is to to assume that a person's behavior is solely caused by them, rather than ignoring that situational factors may be playing. You know, so if like someone cuts you off on the road, well, you might think, well, that person's just a bad person rather than maybe looking at the broader context. And so, you know, I wrote that book because my younger brother, well, I mean, I came from a, a background of addiction, you know, so my father was an extreme addict. My brother was an addict. My brother was someone, my younger brother, who's someone who has an amazing amount of potential and even genuine desires to change his life. But he just, for many, many years, never really did anything about it. And I just wanted to write a book to him to explain to him why it wasn't working out, you know? And um, so that was, that was really the trigger was that he wasn't changing his environment, you know? And and you, and you, you just have to, I I tell you that, you know, after, after I read that book, Ben, and you enlightened me um, a week later, I don't, I've, I'm not sure I've ever told people this on the radio show, but I'm going to fess up to how important that book was because my wife and I had lived in another house for 22 years, and um, I, I, I realized reading your book, I was spending 70% of my awake hours when I wasn't at the office in one chair, you know, doing, doing one thing, which was not, not, not leading me to be the person that I wanted to be. And so one weekend, I bought a house to be able to change my event. Uh, my my surroundings, if you will, and uh, so I always tell Ben I was his most expensive reader, 
Um, I, he's yet to he's yet to repay me back for the house, but I guess I should <laughs> I should probably pay him because it's worked out for us very very well. Um, but, but well, I, it's more like I'm the most expensive book you've ever read. <laughs> yeah, there's there's the, you know the Bible. Yeah, that I I guess we can't call that one an expense either. I'm I'm happy with both the investments, frankly. Um, but James Clear came along after that with Atomic Habits, and I and I added on to some of the things that you taught us in the Willpower Doesn't Work book. Um, I start most of my talks out by reminding people that success is never dependent upon one thing, but failure can be. And I, I've, I've got that tattooed right next to you have to change your environment if you're going to change a habit. Um, I think those, those two things are just so critical, you know, especially when you get into my realm, which is, is the financial world of doing financial planning. There's just so many things you've got to be able to cross and cover um, and, and be able to take care of. So let's let's start walking through the the reason for this conversation for your new book that's coming out. Personality isn't permanent. Tell me what got you started on that one. I and I I really appreciate your brother um, as the one who was the driver of the last part. But tell me tell me what we what got us to here. Yeah, well, so addiction still being an interesting subject to me after I wrote Willpower Doesn't Work. I read the book The Body Keeps the Score, which is the definitive book on trauma. My main interest was wondering, was better understanding how trauma unresolved is a core driver of addiction. I had been recommended to read that book for quite a while. So I read that back, book back in 2018. And the thing that kept punching me in the face while I was reading that book was how much trauma stunts or what the, heat, what the author says is called freezes your personality. You know, and it keeps you stuck in the past. It stops you from emotionally developing. Um, and obviously, my book's not fully about trauma, but that just opened the door for me to, because I wanted to better explain why people get stuck. And one of the core tenets in psychology is that the best way to predict a person's future behavior is by looking at the past. And that's obviously true for most people but if you're someone who wants to make big change in your life you don't want that to be true for you you want your future self to be the thing driving your behavior and so after i read that book the body keeps a score i just thought okay this is one of the core explanations to why people get stuck and it's not that they have an innate personality that doesn't change it this is one of the reasons obviously environment being another big one as far as why people get stuck in repetitive cycles. And so I just wanted to break down the lies and show people a lot of the research that shows, look, you're not stuck the way you are. Here's one of the reasons why you're stuck. Here's another and here's another. You can make core, you know, proactive adjustments to become the person you want to be. So I just wanted to rewrite the narrative on personality because it's such a hot topic. It is. Uh, there, un undoubtedly, it's a hot topic. So Angie, uh, Angie's a big Myers-Briggs person. And... I um I so I I don't I don't resonate with Myers Briggs near as well as she does, but you know, and I don't call Colby a personality test. Is that fair? Do you agree with that? Yeah, Colby would agree. You know, or Kathy Colby, she says it's not a personality test. Yeah, uh, I know she says that. I was I said, do you agree, Ben Hardy? Um, I consider it. I I don't know. I wouldn't call. I wouldn't even call Myers Briggs a personality test. But um, yeah. I don't really know. To me, it does the exact same thing as Myers-Briggs. It creates an identity. Uh, and identity and personality are two different things. Identity actually being far more important. Identity is how you self-describe. It's your narrative. It's how you define yourself. And your identity shapes your viewpoint of yourself in the world, which you know drives your behavior, which over time becomes your personality. So I think that it does similar things, but I think I think I, I know a lot of really smart people, obviously, who use both. Um, I'm more privy to the Colby just because that's the world I'm in. Right. Um, so I know a lot of really smart people who use and rely on it. I also think it kind of creates a confirmation bias. You know, like I think that people want, for example, to be a quick start or that that's who they are in a particular role. But that's not who they are in all aspects of their life. But be, but, but because that role is such a dominant aspect of their identity. That's how they see themselves in all situations, which isn't always true. And, and that's, and I will tell you as a two, three, 10, three, I have the same Colby numbers as Dan Sullivan. Um, I, I will tell you that I agree that I am certainly not a quick start in all, in all environments. Um, that or in all roles, right? Or in all roles. 
Hi, Joni Michaels here. Joe's been hosting financial radio programs for over 20 years, and during his seven years at Purdue, Joe developed the five critical elements. You see, there are five areas we all go through that can impact and even derail our retirement plans. YourLifeAfterWork.com has been focused on you on your retirement for over 20 years. You may have had a 401k as well as IRAs. Those are all defined contribution plans. Consider this program is about your defined contribution plans becoming defined distributions. You see, we all exit. You'll either take money out of those retirement plans when you decide or when the IRS decides, or your heirs will have to deal with the situation, but we all exit. I encourage you to call 800-928-4001 to meet with one of the talented financial advisors at the Financial Enhancement Group. I've listened to this show for years, and what Joe says just makes sense. Don't you think it's time for you to call 800-928-4001, yourlifeafterwork.com. Now let's get back to the show. But I do very, very much buy into the fact that people use their personality as, a, as an anchor as opposed to having future goals and objectives drive them. So I very, very much appreciate what you're doing in that book and just trying to make people think. Um, if, if anything, it makes you think. Go ahead, Angie. I see the, I see the world. The, no, the, the no I, I like listening. And I definitely agree with not putting yourself in a box. And being able to um, develop or, you know, into any role in the future. But to me, using something like Myers-Briggs in a positive way would be to use it to identify that there are differences between people. And, I mean, like this, for instance. Let's say that I'm an introvert and you're an extrovert. And we have a disagreement. And you as an extrovert, you want to talk about it right now. I want answers. Let's go. And the other person is just going to kind of shut down and walk away. And if you know and you learn that that other person is wired a little differently than you, then what you would say is, I'll tell you what, we're going to get together tomorrow at 2 o'clock and we're going to talk about this. And that person would that's maybe fair. be ready. That's fair. Because you identified a difference. And so that's why I like being able to um, – you know, determine, you know, just the four basic differences in people. Gotcha. And there's way more, way more. But if you understand someone else is different than you, it helps in communication. Yeah. I, and I think that people can use them in positive ways. I think that often they can come with a lot of negative baggage when it comes to people. Like it, people become very fixated on who their current self is and they can become very definitive. Like even just this statement of I am an introvert or an extrovert would actually be a non psychological way of saying things. Um, from a site, like there, one of the core theories in, in psychology on personality, the most studied one is called the big five. Um, and you would, ever, you would never actually say you're an introvert or an extrovert. Um, actually Carl Jung, who, who is apparently the basis of the Myers-Briggs, he said that there's no such thing as a pure introvert or extrovert. Such a person would be in a lunatic asylum. Right. Um, but um, what you would get if you took the big five is you would actually get a percentile rank based on the, like, the actual population. So you may get like the 30th percentile as an example on extroversion, meaning you're at the 30th percentile, meaning you're pretty introverted. But you'd never actually say I'm an introvert. But I, but I get 100% what you're saying. I guess just the way you process. I guess maybe that's just using a word. Maybe it's the wrong word to say introvert or extrovert. But people do process information oh, differently. People totally do. No, people do. And I think it's good to know where a person's coming from. And these tests can potentially help you with that. This may be in your book, Ben, that I haven't got there yet. But do you see a difference? I know, I know these tests are the rage right now. I mean, there's, you know, the... Yeah, you know, the road back to me, you know, that that Ian wrote and, and everything else that's coming out. But is, but is there a difference between how millennials process taking these exams versus somebody my age at 53? Um, let's just say there is a difference in how they process it. Yes, but also there's a difference in how they would answer it. Um, you know, we all answer tests like this based on the situation we're in. That's actually one of the problems with these tests is, is that you will answer them differently based on like literally the time of day you take the test, the environment you're in when you take the test. Um, and so chances are because a person in their 50s or six, you know, 50s or 60s has way more past. Uh, it would be interesting the purpose for why they would take the test. Uh, most people take these tests because they're trying to, you know, understand or discover some aspect of themselves 
And so it'd be interesting, the purpose for taking the test at age 50, just as, as an example, versus age 30. Usually someone at age 30 would probably be trying to do more self-discovery. I'd be interested in why someone in their 50s would take the test. Um, we actually allowed our kids, like our, we had our three kids take the big five. Um, and the big five is very different in its test construction. It's a lot more what we would consider a valid measure. Like one of the problems with the typical type-based personality tests and from a psychological perspective, like we don't believe in personality types, but one of the problems with the test construction is, is usually they're forced choice where you're forced to answer one of four questions. Sometimes none of them fit. Whereas usually with a correct psychological measure, it's based on what we call Likert scale, which is where you would answer a question like, you know, you'd, it, it would ask you a question like, to what extent are you comfortable in social situations? You know, and you would have, on one end of the spectrum, absolutely agree, or on the other one, totally not. And then in the middle, there'd be a neutral. And you'd be able to answer somewhere in the middle. Um, and so, like, that's actually a better way of doing it. But we had our kids take the test. And it was super funny to watch them take it. Because, like, we, were, we didn't want to influence their scores at all. You know, one's 12, one's 10, one's 8. But we just wanted to just see how they took the test. And I even decided to take the test. And I, before I submitted my answers, I gave, I showed my scores to my wife and she said, what do you think? Do you think this is accurate? And she didn't, she said, she questioned me on a few of them, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, people answer them in totally different ways for different reasons. Well, so it, it'll be interesting, as you pointed out in the book, the longest test that this has ever been is 63 years with the people in Germany, I think it was, right? Yeah, the Scotland study. Yeah, yeah. Scotland. And um, so you have to you have to keep those answers around for your kids to take when they're 75. Um, you know. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I can tell you <laughs> don't agree. I, I don't agree with the scores that my kids gave for themselves, ah. you know, and my and my wife didn't agree with the scores that I gave for myself. You know, she said that I, I let her look at my responses before we submitted the thing. And she didn't say anything. And after I submitted, I said, what did you think of what I said? And she said, I thought it was interesting. She said, I wouldn't have scored you the way you scored yourself, you know, but she's like, and that's, that's really the thing is, is that you're self scoring, which means that it's really a statement of identity because you're self describing versus personality is more how you show up and other people see you differently than you see yourself. Absolutely. Hey, folks, you're listening to Consider This Program. I'm the host, Joe Clark, along with Angie Kinzer. We have guest Dr. Benjamin Hardy, a uh, New York Best Time seller by far of one of my favorite books, Willpower Doesn't Work, and an author of a new book that he told me. Now, you have to understand, his first book caused me to move my house. I literally bought a new house based on what I read in his book. It's that powerful. He titles this book, Personality Isn't Permanent and says it's a more important book than the first one. So I am, uh, I am trying to take it in as quickly as I can and very honored to bring it here <laughs> uh, to tell you guys, as soon as you can get it, get it ordered. Um, it's, you know, I, I love, I love this, the conversations that the last book created, and I think we'll have many more out of this, Ben. Um, so here, let's, let's turn this to money. And I, I'm the, as I read permanent, and I'm only a third of the way through, so feel free to correct me. As I read personality isn't permanent it it appears to me that you're making the argument that whatever personality I had when I was born with is going to change over over years as as other things around me change you know my age changes things that I learn those kind of things is that a fair statement yes okay. absolutely your personality is going to change irrespective of intentional change yes so now here is a as a certified financial planner here is one of my challenges inside of our industry. Uh, from an investment standpoint, you know, you come in and you open up an account, and my pair of planners are going to ask you this question called risk tolerance. And yep. they're, they're going to take you through 20 to 25 questions about how you feel about risk and loss. Now, my 32-year career tells me that you don't call anything risky that goes up, and you call anything that slightly goes down risky. So I'm not a huge fan of this test. Um, and yet, it's something that the SEC says we have to do and it has to be there. 
Hi, Joni Michaels here. We know you care about your money, but are you tired of worrying about it? The Financial Enhancement Group takes care of people just like you who don't want to worry about their money. As fiduciaries, the team at the Financial Enhancement Group will care for your nest egg just like they would care for their own. If they worry in your situation, there are many decisions you'll need to make as you face retirement, and the team at the Financial Enhancement Group is here to help you. Call 800-928-4001 or go to yourlifeafterwork.com to set up a time to meet. The confusion and complexity of retirement is almost as daunting as is the excitement of retirement. Don't let your fear and frustration of taxes and investing derail your retirement. Call the Financial Enhancement Group at 800-928-4001. They'll give you a complimentary second opinion on your strategy for retirement. Begin your adventure in your life after work. Call 800-928-4001 or yourlifeafterwork.com. Now back to Consider This Program with Joe Clark. Well, good morning and welcome back to Consider This Program. I'm your host, Joe Clark. I'm Angie Kinzer. You, uh, I hope, very much enjoyed the Ben Hardy interview. A good friend. Uh, we are in two mastermind groups together. Um, one is called Strategic Coach, and one is uh, the Genius Network out in, uh, out in Scottsdale, Arizona. And very, very fond of both of them. Um, they're both good at creating tools, Angie. And... I challenged Angie this morning and Amanda this morning, and now I'm going to challenge you folks that are out there in the world to think about this um, personally, but certainly professionally. And what we were challenged to do was to create a list of three things that we had before the virus that we're going to keep, three things that we brought new during the virus that we learned about that we've added to our life, like i Zoom is now a verb in Joe's world, right? We, we Zoom constantly. Um, what, what three things, and, and there can be more than three, but what three things do you have in your life now that you didn't have that make your life better? And then what are three things that you did prior to coming into the virus that you're not going to leave with, that you're just, you're not going to do? And do that from a personal side, and, uh, and a professional side, right? So, Angie, since you've had all day to think about this. No, I haven't. Uh, well, I, we, we talked about this earlier this morning. I know. You, you haven't thought about it yet. No, because, I, re- I mean, I really do need to sit down and kind of make a list of all the different. It's, it's, uh, it is a positive focus is one thing. In, in almost all things, there is something good that can come out of it. And I know this is a hard time to say that, but in... In, in almost every opportunity or every event, there is an opportunity for us to improve one way or the other. Uh, and and I, I believe that will happen. Um, so I can go back to the last crisis, 08 and 09, right? I have not watched the news since then, right? That was one of, that's the thing I left behind, right? And, you know, the, and some people go, how in the world do you do that? And I go, well... I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I would like to do it, but I feel too guilty because I feel like if I'm burying my head in the sand and I'm not knowing what's going on or trying to help in situations or do my part in society, then I feel like uh, I'm yeah, letting people down. I so gotcha. I force myself I, to know what's going on. I, uh, I didn't have to read anything in the, in the, in the newspaper about the Christian center needing help because there were more people that were homeless because of this. Right. I mean, it's, I, I don't think that's where the help is, but th- just think about things, folks. Um, that's what we try to do, and we try to we try to help you consider things. We try to help make us make us better. I'm learning the same time we're learning. You know, I I uh, I wrote something down in my journal a couple weeks ago that, you know, we help reduce financial regrets. That's what drives me to do this show. It's what drives FEG's engine, and uh, and the bottom line is people come to us because we've made mistakes that you don't want to make, right? <laughs> right? And in the last 32 years, taking care of a lot more than a thousand people, we take care of more than a thousand now. If it's not a mistake I've made, it's mistakes I've seen others make. You don't want to make those mistakes, right? I mean, we help reduce financial regrets. Give Angie a call, 800-928-4001. My friends, stay, stay safe and have a wonderful, wonderful week. 
been listening to Consider This Program with Joe Clark. As a certified financial planner, former professor at Purdue University, and with 31 years of experience helping families just like you eliminate the fear and confusion of retirement, Joe's team has the answers to your questions. Go to yourlifeafterwork.com or call 800-928-4001 and find a time to meet with the Financial Enhancement Group. There's nothing that will separate you from your retirement as fast as the IRS. There are many questions that can be answered at the Financial Enhancement Group. Questions like when to take Social Security? How will my 401k be taxed? These questions are just the tip of the iceberg and you need to be asking these questions now before it's too late. The Financial Enhancement Group has offices in Anderson, Fishers, and Lafayette, Indiana, but they also take care of families in 30 other states. You care about your retirement, you don't want to worry about your money, then the Financial Enhancement Group is right for you. As fiduciaries, they are required by law to treat your money as if it were their own and they were in the same situation. Call 800-928-4001 or 